Welcome to the Gruber Afternoon Show, not Morning Show. I don't think I've ever said it that way. We have <laughs> special guests with us today. We have Mark Hanchett from a New Founder and CEO. Thank you. And uh, Victor Atlasman, who is the CTO of <laughs> Chief, New <laughs> Chief Tour Chief Officer. Officer right? yeah. yes. <laughs> and we're going to cover a number of topics today. So if you have questions, let us know where you're coming in from. Uh, join us, and uh, we'll we'll see if we can make this an informative podcast. So um, I have a question to start this thing off, I guess, for uh, Mark. Um, fascinating uh, story, backstory. Uh, we went through Gruber Motor Company just now. And um, the question is, can you walk us through the journey from Atlas Motor Vehicles to new? Because that was the original company, correct? Yeah, we. Uh, I actually I founded the company officially in 2016. Um, there was actually a three-year period before that where I was working on the idea. But uh, officially 2016. And we transitioned from Atlas to new uh, in roughly the spring around May time period of uh, 2023. And that was really focused on uh, the much larger vision that I had when I started, which is electrification is sexy. It's cool. I love the, the idea of the truck. Like we're going to do that. That is where I kind of started, but um, it's really a bigger picture problem. Mm -hmm. Um we are fundamentally, from a humanity standpoint, we are transitioning from this idea of internal combustion and consumables to renewable energy. And mobility is the catalyst that's pushing that forward. And new was really, um, it, it made sense. It was the, the company, the brand, the broader sort of visionary aspect of it, whereas Atlas was, it just it was just vehicles, right? It was it was just trucks. That was the only thing that was encompassing that. So we transitioned to new because we were focused on, and we still is part of the mission, but the larger sort of energy transition from where we are today to where I believe we're going tomorrow. Gotcha. And uh, the X is silent. Tell us about the name. Yeah. So um, it's actually an infinity symbol in between there. Ah, okay. Um, and the idea behind it, the the concept behind it is this idea that I've I've had for kind of the, the first day is the future of energy is abundant. It's accessible. We're going to reach a point where, and you know this actually because you're in the data center world. Um, so you understand data cost years ago to data cost today. And you could probably relate to that in that what we are going to see in the future is a transition in the energy space where today we pay for a consumable tomorrow we're going to pay for access and the idea of how much you consume for most people is going to go away so can you break that down because this is something that i think is kind of revolutionary and one of the reasons i've joined um and you were saying uh, using your words it's like today nobody looks anymore because it's a flat fee how much do you pay per text message on your phone it's a flat fee yeah. how much do you pay per minute uh your internet at home you know do you have do you pay per megabyte not anymore and you're going to pay for access to energy rather than how much energy you consume because it's, gonna, it's going to be so abundant mm -hmm. it's going to be available everywhere mm -hmm. So that is the premise. That's the foundational sort of thing that we're doing. And that, that's kind of the mission behind new. Um, vehicles is a part of that. Charging and infrastructure is a part of that. Energy storage, renewable generation, all of those things are a part of that mission. And there are certain pieces that have to be built to get there. But it's all us marching towards, racing towards that future where energy truly is accessible and abundant. Everybody has access to it. And if you think about that moment in history or in you know humanity's sort of span of our entire existence, that's going to be a fundamental transition for us. Mm -hmm. the, the things that we're going to do after that point are, are going to be incredible. Mm -hmm. How does AI play into any of that? Um, AI has a direct role in, in, from my perspective, the applications of kind of what we do after this. So today, if you think about AI and, and what it is today, it's a very power intensive thing. It's a very um, expensive thing to do. So as we start to transition in that way, our ability to scale that and learn more and develop that technology is gonna play, it, it's going to accelerate that from my perspective, in my opinion. Um, and then in terms of how we manage energy, distribute energy, um, that, that's going to be a fundamental thing too. We, Victor and I are firm believers that the future is not centralized, like giant, 
production and storage facilities. It's a completely distributed ecosystem of energy and you're gonna have little bits everywhere and the transfer of that across the world, right, or around the world is, is gonna become fundamentally important to reaching that goal. So, so let's talk about that a little bit and as well as the AI. So on the AI side of things, it's gonna help determine where to put this distributed energy resource. DER is the term that's coined in the industry <laughs> for setting up that distribution network. And you're gonna start seeing micro nodes. Micro nodes are essentially uh, areas of power generation, uh, specifically now used in um, battery energy storage, especially. You see a lot of the growth in California um, because the issue right now, you have the power in the power plant and needs to get delivered to your customer that's 100, 200, 300 miles plus away. Uh, and these distributed energy resources allow you to localize it, whether it's in somebody's house, like a virtual power plant is another term for it, or it's on a neighborhood where you have a box that's located at the end of the block, or you have it uh, nearby in the city to say, hey, I collect it from, from this big generating plant. And then when the community needs it, it sends it out. Because there is a term also called duck curve. And we produce so much solar energy here here in Arizona that it is basically almost in excess. It's almost too much, but then come nighttime, um, there's no solar and we have now have to rely on these generating plants um, to produce so much energy, especially as people start to drive home and it starts to set sunset and everybody who has an EV has to plug in. And typically everybody waits around the same time when the peak rates uh, end at, uh, it's, it's five to nine, nine to five. So at 9 p.m., um, everybody plugs in at the same time and there's no solar at that time. And it puts such a strain on the grid that there's gotta be solutions out there to support um, the distributed energy resources that you're gonna start seeing more of. Likewise, one thing that I do mention about the distribution of power um, and where AI comes to play is you start seeing clusters of EV owners. So if I get an EV, I tend to find out that my neighbor sees it and he says, or they say, hey, I want one too. And then you start to see clusters. And the unfortunate thing is the transformers that service that particular area cannot feed those clusters of EVs. So the utility companies, whether APS or SRP as we have over here, have computer systems that say, hey, there's a large load at this particular area and they'll perform a service upgrade. But they don't do it in advance. They say, hey, there's a demand now for it, then they upgrade. So we're not prepared for the future or rather the utilities are not prepared, which opens the door for us to come in and set up a network for a localized power distribution and energy delivery and kind of transform the way of uh, energy, uh, pay for access rather. Mm -hmm. Fascinating, we've got some questions coming in. Why don't we address those and then we can talk about something that I, I think the uh, uh, viewers are going to be fascinated with as well, which is something having to do with a cyber truck. I want to talk about that. So we've got Instagram. I love science says, good morning. Uh, good afternoon for us. I don't know where you are, but yes, thanks for joining us. Highlander, one of our regulars. He says, hi, gang. Thanks for joining us. Jake Riddle, another a person that we see often uh, from Facebook. Have you guys seen the new 200 kW DC <laughs> fast chargers by Gravity with the support of Google, which are the size of most level two chargers? Who wants to take that one? Oh, man. Um, we spoke for hours about this the other yeah, day. Yeah, Victor was very uh, vocal about this, too, uh -huh. publicly. Um, so uh, there's actually a cabinet still that's, like, hiding in the background. And that's what I think a lot of people don't know about some of these larger DC fast chargers is that mm -hmm. the power supplies are actually sitting somewhere else. There's, like, a, a cabinet, right, mm -hmm. or a box that's sitting somewhere else. Right. And they call it invisible charging. Yeah. Uh. Um, so uh, there's there's a lot of companies building chargers that are out there. Um, we've definitely seen gravities. Uh, so um, and I'm just going to plug like new. Uh, we are technically the the highest powered charging system that is publicly available today mm -hmm. at 750 kilowatts, scalable to 1.5 megawatts in the current approach and let's throw the caveat when when people say 750 kilowatts or rather 200 kilowatts what people don't know is there's a limitation also on the cable yeah so just because somebody advertises 100 200 kilowatts their cable might not be able to support 50 amps which means if you have like a 400 volt vehicle architecture come in and plug in you'd be lucky to get more than 50 kilowatts out of a system so usually when you see uh, a charger rated at 350 kilowatts it means it's probably rated at a thousand volts 350 kilowatts so if you have a 500 volt you're only going to get half that power so yes. true 750 kilowatts yeah so if you like you deal with tesla a mm -hmm. lot and uh tesla will draw 670 amps 
mm -hmm. uh, like a Model 3, Model uh, Model Y, the Model plaid. S Plaid yeah. when they're charging. Um, but that that's the equivalent of a almost 700 kilowatt charger if for most applications because they're typically a 700 kilowatt would be like 700 amps and a thousand volts which no company does i believe a thousand volts today here in the u.s anyways mm -hmm. um so to that point and, and this is where like all of the challenges come around charging there's all that marketing that's out there of oh it's 200 kilowatts or five minutes for 200 miles or whatever it is well we all know that that none of that is actually true because the vehicle side is the bottleneck mm -hmm. not necessarily the charger or to victor's point it's a 200 kilowatt charger but it's 200 amps at a thousand volts so when you plug a tesla in it's 50 kilowatts not 200 so in, the, so in the early days of prototyping we hooked up uh, a tesla plaid to our charger a prototype charger uh it was a uh, kyle connor had a tesla plaid he came by he's mm -hmm. like let's crank out as much power as we could at the time we didn't have a nax or uh, a cable that supported tesla so we used an adapter that adapter was only rated for 300 amps and we're like hey this is a controlled environment we can monitor the temperatures and we released a video on this we pushed double the amount of power 600 amps into this vehicle it didn't start as this is a controlled environment it started with let's melt this thing <laughs> <laughs> well and the kyle was okay with that i'm taking it. kyle's he, like he said that it was <laughs> i warned him and i said we will be monitoring we'll we'll do temperature checks and make sure hey at any point of danger we hit the e-stop we'll end the test right and we said let's let's crank it to full it's full sand this is term um and we're the fastest non-tesla company to charge a tesla plaid um, we gave it everything it wanted and we like to repeat results like that like with the cyber truck we're still today the fastest one to charge a cyber truck above even tesla because mm -hmm. their v4 superchargers aren't out yet so they can't support the 800 volt architecture mm -hmm. but we can and, and we've proven it over and over and there's some caveats because there's one term that's marketing and marketing plays a strong play in, in, in the education world, like I'll come back to gravity because they advertise 500 kilowatts and it's not 500, but it's the same thing for the Tesla superchargers besides them being rated at 400 volts um, because that's what most of their vehicle architecture is at. Um, they're limited by the power. And then if I'm assuming your viewers, your listeners have plugged into a supercharger, if somebody plugs in next to you, you've just given them half your charge right. and you're there for twice as long. We don't do that. We don't derate the charger and we don't split the power. So when we say a true 750, you're getting everything the vehicle asks for. Somebody pulls up next to you, you're still getting the full power. Mm -hmm. Now it's unfortunate when lower powered vehicles come in, but that's the space that we play in. The Chevy Volt. The Chevy Volt, <laughs> Bolt, yeah, <laughs> at 50 kilowatts. Um, and then the gravity, the, the, the lack of education on the gravity side for uh in marketing is they do split the power so it, it's you would get 500 kilowatts as long as you're at that thousand volt range and there's only one vehicle on the market right now that gets close to that and that's the lucid air and that's why it took them so long to convert to nax uh is because that higher voltage architecture makes it difficult to be compatible so they actually have a, a, a the battery pack splits between the 400 800 volt architecture same as the cybertruck same as the rivian so they can support the older standard. Not on the Lucid, right? Lucid runs through the power module. They have a 50 kilowatt. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah but they can get full power. Um, but the biggest issue is a lot of the cables that exist, um, and even the liquid-cooled cables, they're adjacent cooling. We discussed earlier about the immersion-cooled cable technology that we invented to do the megawatt charging uh, demo, and you're starting to see more of the technology come out there. But all the systems out there that have liquid cooling currently don't use that. Um, and are limited to about two, 300 amps, which means um, a plaid, even though it says 350 kilowatts on the charger, you'd be lucky to get more than 240 kilowatts. Hold that thought. Yeah. I think people want to hear more about immersion cooling. I was fascinated when you guys were telling me. you got a few more to get through here. Um, YouTube Highlander, awesome guest speaker, gang. Thank you. Uh, YouTube Simon Harris. Hey, guys, I'm watching in London, UK. Love the suggestion about paying a flat fee for energy. Okay. Yeah. Can I touch on that for a oh, minute? Absolutely. We actually have a pilot program running where uh, we've got a number of customers that subscribe for a flat fee for charging for a fixed rate a month. So um, we've got a gentleman. Uh, we, uh, Thank you. Yeah, uh, his name's Thomas. Um, he has so far utilized, what, 3.8? 
eight. Uh, to, as of today, he has consumed 3.8 megawatt hours, enough for a town right. of electricity for a flat fee. For a flat fee every single month. Um, right. So he doesn't pay extra necessarily, doesn't pay anything else. And we're testing this out today. Uh, and we're finding that customers love it because they can't necessarily charge at home. Uh, or they they do like Uber or Lyft, right, or DoorDash mm -hmm. or something like delivery services, and they're looking for that like consistent sort of rate and that low cost to get the most value mm -hmm. out of what you know their vehicle can do for them. And I, I didn't think it was public yet, so now it's public for everyone to know about that it is an option, or at least you're going to see it soon. But one thing, we Oops. don't just talk about it. We are doing it. Mm -hmm. So when we say we want to do this, we are. So mm -hmm. you pay for access to the charger, and it's all you can consume. And the price model around it is kind of like uh, um, the buffets, you know, like you have some that eat more, some that eat less. But the point is that you're comfortable because it's a flat fee. And so some, some months you might use less, some you might use more. But the whole thing is it's peace of mind. You don't have to worry, do I have enough to pay for gas tomorrow? Great you know analogy. Yeah. Sign me up. The buffet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. sign I don't even up. have an EV, but sign me up. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, YouTube Highlander, excellent question, Sean. Yes, uh, agreed. And the um, question is, are you going to be competitive with charge point chargers being installed? So that's an interesting uh, market in general for the general uh, CPOs, charge point operators, as they call them, um, because there's also a company named charge point and many of the others out there. And it is about what the, the costs are for the utility and what it costs in order to maintain the services at those locations. So it's a very competitive market in terms of kilowatt hour pricing. Um, but what, like we are the cheapest in the country right now at 33 cents a kilowatt hour. So if you come to our charger, it's at 1828 North Higley Road in Mesa, you will only pay either a flat fee if you sign up for that or 33 cents a kilowatt hour. Mm -hmm. Still half priced to almost anywhere in the country. Amazing. For commercial yeah. charging uh, caveat. So YouTube Highlander, he says, what's the expected lifespan of these chargers? So we we target a minimum of 10 years of life for the charger, or the, the system itself. Obviously, we're aiming for, you know, higher than that. Mm -hmm. uh, but the reason for that is the capital expenses uh, required to do some of these installs and deployments, especially for those that are in our partner program. Uh, we're trying to minimize the the capital expenditures over the life of that particular system so they get the most value out of it. While we are focused on owning and operating, we also have a partner program where others that might be interested in deploying these systems on their property, maybe it's their business, whatever it is. We're trying to focus on minimizing that capital expense for them up front as much as we possibly can, even including a recurring like subscription model where We'll do maintenance, we'll monitor that system, we'll replace components for it. Uh, and basically the upfront capital expense for them is just tied to the install and the utility integration, not necessarily the charger itself. And that's over a long period of time. We also realize that um, today's chargers that are being installed at 200 kilowatts or less, and unfortunately that's the number we're gonna stick with because that's how we started today. But 200 kilowatts and less, that's almost outdated mm. now. Because the newer vehicles, especially the new Silverado EV, the Hummer EV, the Lucid Air, Porsche's new vehicle that's coming out, um, even Rivian's, and, and most of them are well above 200, but they're actually well above 300 Kias, right? Almost all Kia vehicles, almost all, I think Hyundai, Hyundai, Hyundai however you pronounce it now, I can't pronounce it anymore. Um, but they're all well above 300 kilowatts, so we're very much so trying to focus on uh, deployment of infrastructure and cost that translates to a longer term oh. ROI. So more value for the dollar, basically. But it's also the experience because the question is, how do we compete against the likes of Tesla? It has mm -hmm. tens of thousands of, of charge stations out there. Well, one, they're antiquated um, infrastructure, like their systems, I said, 400 volt architecture. You already have vehicles that are a thousand volts or close to it. Um, and our technology is actually designed to upgrade in terms of power from not just 750, but up to 1.5 megawatts. We're also standard agnostic. So the issue is that Tesla's got the next, and yes, they can install Magic Dock, but they have to replace the infrastructure. For us, we support nearly every charge standard that's out there because we own the hardware, we own the software, and we own uh, a lot of the land. But we don't support Chatamo. 
Yeah, Sorry. that's that's one thing. That's a, <laughs> uh, and there's a few other GBTs and and uh, other standards that's not here in the U.S. Uh, listen, a customer came in and said, "Hey, can you do Chatham all? We, I want a thousand of them." We might have a cable back there, and yeah, yeah we might be able to do something. Yeah. Uh, but here's the biggest issue: you're going to start seeing a lot of pickup trucks or a lot of uh, electric trucks. Uh, any of them start towing, there's no place for them to charge. Medium heavy duty vehicles, no place for them to stop. And so all these companies, Nikola is over here, they couldn't drive their battery truck from, from Phoenix to LA because there's no charging station for them to stop at. So our site design also encompasses that, that user experience, pull through stations, char charging, support any trailers, uh, lounge area. Um, what else? Yeah, I mean, we were, because we were talking with you earlier when we were going through the, the shop, right, and you're showing us all the roadsters and all that stuff, and that's the the, the quintessential sort of early adopter mm -hmm. kind of phase. But as we move forward, commercial vehicles, it, from my perspective, commercial pickup and full-size pickup trucks and even big SUVs towing and hauling, that's the chasm that you actually, you want to cross, and um, today it's a lot of early adopters are, are buying EVs and you're kind of transitioning to what I would call like the early majority. But if you want to cross that chasm to mass market, like everybody else that's out there, you have to build solutions that people can tow vehicles with, right? They can haul stuff. Maybe it's a bigger vehicle. I'd love to see a like big electric cement truck, right? Big, right. you know gravel truck or something like roll through here that's completely electric, but they can't do it today. Mm -hmm. So how do we build the infrastructure and make the investments now, knowing that over the next several years, you're going to start to see rapid adoption in those particular markets. And we know companies like Freightliner and Daimler and even Tesla and everybody else that's building these bigger vehicles, they need the infrastructure to be put in place to facilitate sales of those vehicles. So it's a a chicken and egg problem right now and i'm a big fan of like listen let's just not have that debate let's hatch the egg and grow the chicken so it's you not know, how that's, you say it well yeah that's not, i is swear PG a lot. i don't know if this is pg rated or not but um so uh, who yeah. drives a ford yeah well, hold on yeah. so i actually have a question for you guys too back here and i think uh we might have another guest back here that has a question but so that's me with the Ford Edge. I know. Oh, yeah. I know. <laughs> okay. Uh, but I, my question it goes back to how you're saying you're the lowest cost for electricity. Um, and I'm, I just, I, I don't know how it works, I guess. How is it that the different chargers have different rates and people can charge different? If you guys aren't the utility, are you guys generating power? How, how does it happen that you're in control of that? part of it so there's a couple strategies around that one is there's there's the endpoint cost which is the cost when the user plugs in mm -hmm. um so when they plug in what are you going to charge them and there is actually there's a limit if i do the math correctly right now uh the average for like a competitor not in, not new but a competitor is 64 cents a kilowatt hour that is an equivalent of about seven dollars and fifty cents a gallon yep of gasoline. Oh, oh wow, okay. So, um, and you're seeing those prices just continuously hike up because those companies are chasing profitability, but they're doing it the wrong way. So they're out there just increasing costs, right? Or increasing the the, the price on the, the end user thinking, well, they have to pay, so therefore they're going to pay. Well, then here comes Tesla, right? Tesla's gonna come in with a much cheaper price. Um, our focus is on customer experience, scalability, repeatable, um sort of experiences every time you plug in but also we start tying in other strategies around energy storage and you know buying at low prices and things like that our mesa facility doesn't have energy storage yet um but we've got more or less a flat fixed fee on the back end so we know how much our our delta is going to be we know what our margins are going to be and we can be flexible in that price uh, and i think it's super important to be competitive with everything else that's out there. So if I drive east of Arizona, I'm gonna see gas prices in the 250 to $3 a gallon range. So that is your, your benchmark, right? That, that's where everyone else is gonna compare you. So we're focused on, okay, how do we remain competitive there? Give them a positive customer experience so they continuously come back. Cause it's really about volume. And from a business standpoint, it's about volume per minute Right, so how many kilowatt hours can we deliver per minute? Um, and there's a limit because all batteries right now that are in EVs are kind of fixed, right? They have a maximum rate. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but we know that's going to continue to change, uh, but we could be competitive on price today because that's what people are measuring you against, right? They're saying, if I take a road trip, how much is it going to cost? What's the equivalent? And right now you're seeing articles that say, wow, my Rivian to drive across country is cheaper than my Honda Pilot. That's not a good thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's uh, added costs not associated with the product as well, too. Like, for example, you and uh, gas stations with convenience stores. Um, there's different amenities that drive traffic to that particular area. And there are some hotels that install level two chargers, and it attracts a lot of EV drivers, and it's good for their business. They might not be making money off the charger, so they just do it, a, a, you know, a flat fee or whatnot, or even for free, just to attract the customer to come to their their business. Um, and Highlander wrote, infrastructure is key. And that is some of the most challenging things that you, you're starting to see is, um, especially almost anywhere for high power charging, we were talking about how you recently getting an upgrade in your infrastructure from APS to support chargers. Right. Uh, but the big issue is the utilities don't want to put the money up front. And so we have a lot of technology that supports whatever infrastructure exists, whether it utilizes battery energy storage or utility or whatever means the charger is able to accept AC power, DC power, whatever the grid's available. A lot of people ask about solar. And one thing that I say about solar does work, but you need a lot of it to support the amount of power that we're producing so it's not the ideal solution um but it's also the the what do you call it the uh when you come to the charging station you don't have a canopy in most of the uh charge point stations so you're out in the rain plugging your electric car into a high power charging station and so we support having the covered canopies the lounge area and so there's different means of income other than just how much you charge per kilowatt hour Mm -hmm. And then uh, there was one question. Can you please describe the field support for your chargers? Um, and so a lot of the, the mechanisms inside the charger, um, and this is where AI comes to play, is we're able to do a lot of remote diagnostics for the charger and fix things via software. Uh, a lot of the chargers out there, because they sell them, um, their reliability tends to go down quickly. Um, you know, somebody runs over a cable, and the host who owns the charger, not like not picking on charge point here, but let's say it's a charge point charger who sold the charger to, let's say, a Shell gas station. And the Shell gas station's like, I don't want to spend $500 to replace the cable or whatnot. They're aware that it's broken. They just choose to not fix it because of the cost associated with it. So we've designed our charger to be simple to maintain, whether uh, we own it or a customer owns it. But most of the diagnostics and repair services can be done remotely to determine uh, what the issues are. And it tends to be t typically temperature or software related is what a lot of the reliability issues are for the chargers that exist out there. I'm sure plenty of your customers uh, or listeners have gone to an Electrify America site and it says this on the screen or either it's blank and it just doesn't work. It's mostly a software issue. Um, and we mitigate all those by not having screens for, for starters. And, and two, uh, we're able to control a lot of the environment that our systems are in since we own it rather than um, integrating or slapping pieces together. Sure. So you guys just recently um, were involved with a Cybertruck here. Yes. One of the first <laughs> ones in the state, uh, Dr. Jay Larson's uh, Cybertruck, who was, Prior guest. Yeah, yeah. was on our podcast a few weeks ago or so. So tell us about how all that went and uh, what was significant about that experience. So it's it's we're so I've got a phone call from a few uh, individuals um, saying how they're trying to figure out how to get the Cybertruck. So I'm pretty connected in the network of of other companies, um, and they they know that we had a Cybertruck that was coming up for tests. And they all laughed. In fact, there were a lot of the comments on YouTube that said in Facebook said, "Hey, it's not going to work," and it said, oh, "You know yeah. me." You, you tell me it's not going to work, and I'm going to show so, you. So I gave Victor, what I love about Victor is I'm like, <laughs> we'll, we'll come up with an idea, and I'll say something along the lines of, like, go find me a bunch of Cybertrucks, and let's, like, be the first one to charge it. <laughs> and he's like, okay. This was um, 9 o'clock so, at night. I remember yeah, it from, like, a Saturday. <laughs> so, so Victor finds every <laughs> social media forum, every, like, anything he could find. He's like, hey, Jay, hey, Thank you know, you, Jay. yeah, we, yeah, Jay's fantastic, but um, he just like he just goes out and he just pings everyone to try and find one that's Jay, there. Solomon, Greg, 
Greg, Zach, some of the first Cybertruck owners in uh-huh. the entire state all came and charged. Um, and it, it, it was absolutely phenomenal. Uh, and the first time we got the Cybertruck in, I'm like, it's a race. We got to do it before anybody else does. And so we expected to put a lot of work into it. Like, nobody's done this before. I hear a lot of problems. Yeah, we actually, there's another gentleman who, um, I don't know if we could say who he was, but uh, he was trying to do it. Um, and he was actually calling Victor and like asking for his advice on someone else's system to try and figure out how to solve the problem, I guess. Yeah. Huh. Um, so we, uh, we knew we had to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, and we knew we wanted to be first. And we plugged it in. Everybody was surrounding it. Ex- like, ready to do whatever we need to figure out how to solve or reverse engineer whatever we need to do and it started charging first try plug first try in. amazing drum roll and all of that yeah. yeah yeah we were all standing there well if it doesn't work we got sean on the phone we got our you know our engineers and everybody else are ready we'll we'll just figure it out and yeah he plugged it in and yeah whoop, and, and then... no adapters so it's also a liquid uh immersion cooled cable uh, next it's a somewhat past prototype but pre-release um cable that we got from a partner vendor of ours and he said go to town on it test it right. um and we're still i think today if not one of the few the only one that has a j3400 nax or nacs okay. cable on a working charger we might be the only one because now we're producing them with those cables on um, them. and they're slowly that company slowly getting them you all listed uh and and released but it's the same cable that we have on so there's no difference between before and after um and yeah we're... but the cool thing was so when we plugged it in the first time yes. it was uh well i mean it just worked but it was 400 Four, the volts, 400 volt architecture, 400 volt architecture. And we're like oh, okay you know whatever like all right, we want to hit the 800 volt architecture, and we just unplugged it and plugged it back in, and we we're trying to figure out what like was going. Yeah. yeah, and it just worked. It worked. 800 and volts. It just went 800 <laughs> volts. We're like, oh, okay, like let's figure out what's wrong. Um, so we we actually made only one change, uh, and it was a parameter change in the system. And now every time someone plugs in a Cybertruck, they charge on the 800 volt architecture. So uh, when it's low in the like, well, zero to 15-ish percent standpoint, uh, it's, I think. It's uh, zero to 20 percent. Zero to 20 percent. Um, it it gets that real high peak, like above 250, 300, 327 kilowatts. Yeah, we did, we did a video on that. Mm-hmm. Oh, and if you do see the charge curve, and I do encourage your uh, audience also to see the video of the separate truck charging, you're going to notice a flat line on the top. It's actually the first uh, uh, 15%. The 20% is we're able to get 0 to 20% in five minutes. But it could have been faster, uh, but it wasn't because the Cybertruck caps itself at 327 kilowatts. They, and it's an artificial number. It's not uh, based on the current. It's not based on the temperature. To just say, I'm not going to exceed 327 kilowatts. And so you have that flat line before you start to see that natural curve uh, for the charge pack charging. And based on the other chargers that we've seen, we're about 12% faster than anybody else out there. And we can't wait because they advertise 350 kilowatts charging. We can't wait for them to unlock it or increase the power on it spoke to a few said they're going to do that at some point once they get more data and you're going to be able to charge it even faster so the zero to 99 percent, and you should explain that 99 uh we're yeah. able to do that in approximately 60 60 minutes 65 minutes in traditional tesla fashion with the first model mm-hmm. it holds 99 percent and never hits 100 never. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um we're waiting there we're just we, we like, sat there for i think like 30 minutes and we're like <laughs> is it ever gonna go i unplug it and then it just tick mm-hmm. it's 100 <laughs> um so but yeah what 70 no 70 minutes to 100 percent 99 percent yeah it was it roughly. was about yeah 65 yeah um but and we, we've done the test multiple times yeah. so we can confirm that that to be pretty accurate um and then that's the other unusual thing or the unfortunate thing about teslas is you can't precondition if you say you're you're going to someone else's charger in preconditioning the battery pack is very very important for you to get the maximum performance out of uh, the charging session because if you don't uh precondition that pack you can be there twice as long just because mm-hmm. it needs to cool the battery pack before you pack all that energy into it so yeah so i mean it was it was fantastic we were the the world's first one to do it um the first one to hit 800 volts um and we repeated it so we actually we went and rented another one afterwards Mm -hmm. uh drove it around a few times all the way to zero a little past zero 
Um, and we started doing benchmarking and testing, and it is it is a repeatable curve every single time. It's just 326, 327, that it's probably within a margin of error that I think is acceptable. Um, and every single time it's it's exactly the same curve every time we plug it in. You know what the unfortunate thing is with doing those kind of tests? What's that? You have to drain the battery. And when you have about 330 miles, you have to drive right. to get it back to zero. <laughs> uh, so what what is the future of this type of charging? You guys mentioned immersion cooling. You know, mm -hmm. we're all thinking that at some point in time, the whole notion of plugging a car into a cable to charge is going to be antiquated, and we'll laugh at uh, this period of, of uh, you know, history. But um, in the meantime, uh, you know, the quest for faster charging continues unabated. Um, what, what are some of the solutions that you guys are looking towards? Power is going to be a big thing. But, efficiency. Everything yeah. is a thermal problem. Efficiency equals thermal problem. You solve the thermal problem, you've solved everything. So you're going to see, um, when, when I started the company, uh, we started with a 250 kilowatt hour battery pack in like a full size truck. Mm -hmm. And to charge that in 15 minutes, because the curve is the curve, the curve isn't flat, right? It's a big peak, right? And then you get your CV hold and then it kind of comes down. Mm -hmm. Um, you need about six times or six C at that peak to get that true 15 minute. And we actually, we built battery tech. We've repeatedly, it's live on YouTube, eight minutes, 51 seconds, zero to a hundred percent. Um, and, uh, in order to do that though, I was saying, okay, well, 250 times six, 1.5 megawatts. Mm -hmm. That was our initial target. But when you start getting into the larger vehicles, um, class eight vehicles with a megawatt hour pack, right? Or something that big, you're probably not going to look for a 15 minute charge time. And I mean, you rarely do you fill a big rig up today in 15 minutes, right? It takes a little time and they have to take mandatory breaks and things like that. But we are looking at something that's probably in the 4.5 megawatt range, which then to Victor's point, um, efficiency, cooling, heat generation, power loss, all of those things become very important. I actually think there's a, there is a video out there and we, we've been doing our own testing in terms of our efficiency, but there is data out there. I think it's on a lucid where the packs like 120 kilowatt hours and it consumes 127 mm -hmm. kilowatt hours. And that seven kilowatt hour loss is loss of energy that it's pumping in there, right? Because they measure how much it tries to deliver. It's not necessarily how much goes into it. Let's let's throw this fun fact, by the way. It really doesn't matter how big or small your battery pack is. Uh, the somewhat theoretical limit is a, not theoretical, but the actual limit that you see today is about half hour. So it doesn't matter if you have a 10 kilowatt hour battery pack or a thousand kilowatt hour battery pack, the 2C rate or the 2 two times the charge rate or discharge rate um, is saying that you can only put two times the amount of energy. So a 10 kilowatt hour battery pack, you could push 20 kilowatts into it, which means you'll be done in a half hour. And so the battery technology that you're starting to see uh, developed, especially that uh, new has been working on, has been the 6C rate or faster. Um, theoretically, I've seen 10, 11C rate, but it's not out there yet. And that allows you to charge in seven minutes, but it comes through thermal mitigation. Yeah, but then when we start talking about higher powered, then you start getting into cables that are really unwieldy and they're big garden hoses garden well yeah. well that's what you want as a garden hose right <laughs> but right now you're gonna fire hose yeah. um so victor and the team actually in 2022 when we did our megawatt one point a little over 1.2 megawatts of power delivery 1.2 but um, it was 1.4 1.4 i'm yeah. sorry um <laughs> We were limited by the fuse. We could have gone, gone yeah, more. Yeah, the other equipment's limiting. But the cable size <laughs> yeah. is, uh, it's like a little bit smaller, probably 75% as thick as this, mm -hmm. um, which means like I have a requirement, which is um, my grandmother, uh, who was, I think, almost 90, um, she had to be able to unplug that thing with one hand, right? Move it over and plug it in. Mm -hmm. And you can't actually do that with some like NACs or CCS cables today. And we're talking about doing it with 1.5 to 4.5 megawatts. Mm -hmm. So immersion cooling within the cable, which basically means the coolant has to touch the conductor. There can't necessarily be an insulator inside there. And then it has to be isolated on both sides 
that's going to become incredibly important for the future because you're looking at trying to you're trying to create the most flexible cable you possibly can something that everybody can handle right but it can dump a lot of current mm -hmm. into that particular say at 4000 amps through it with the minimal amount of energy lost while you're doing it it's possible to make a really small cable but then you're going to lose a tremendous amount of power or energy and heat generation even though you can keep it super cool and when these guys did i think the temp on the cable is like 30 yeah we kept c it steady for for a half hour it's it stayed around 30 32 c uh and the target was to not grow a degree every minute and we theorized that it would be 12 minutes before the cable would hit 50 55 c but it didn't because we were actively cooling and it's also one of my interview questions is um our conductor is this thin that's inside but it's liquid cold on the outside and i asked can you push a million amps to uh, uh, copper conductor that's this thick and it's interesting answers that i get because um you know i love theory when it comes to it and then testing that theory is you could push more than a million amps through a conductor this big but you have to deal with the heat problem and so what we did is we created a, a jacket uh in a, a liquid cooling solution that goes around it called immersion cooling mm -hmm. and uh, a few companies are now starting to introduce that in their cable technology today um and it's just a matter of can you pull away the heat quick enough and a majority of the companies today with the adjacent cooling where they have a, a coolant next to the conductor rather than in it uh and you do passive cooling but once you start going towards that megawatt power, you need active chilling, active cooling, and you're familiar with that technology because mm -hmm. you got to cool the cable very quickly and you have to get that heat out as quickly as possible. And we actually started this, in, as Victor mentioned, in the battery pack space. Yep. So your, I mean, uh, your typical cylindrical cell, this is a cylindrical cell, it's wound inside there, right? There's a tab welded at the bottom, there's a tab up top, and there's a big air gap actually above it. When it comes to pulling heat in and out, like Tesla likes to cool on the side of it, right? Rivian cools on the bottom. I think Lucid cools on the bottom and a couple others do yeah. too. Um, uh, Faraday Future runs a coolant around it, like a submersion coolant around it. But a cylindrical cell is actually a very piss poor yeah. conductor of heat um, mm -hmm. because it, in theory it could be very good. But it's not because you're you're insulated on the ends and on the top and everything else. So... Uh, our original technology around things like immersion cooling and why we were doing similar stuff on the, the cable side was because we were actually, uh, we were developing battery cells that were engineered for thermal efficiency. Mm -hmm. So you have all these like copper aluminum layers in there. Those are perfect, well, relative perfect heat conductors. I mean, you you know this, right? You mm -hmm. know, like uh, you have those big... Uh, uh, heat, heat sinks, sinks right yeah. and all that stuff it's basically all those little veins that are on the heat the sinks fins, yeah i turned the um part of our technology is i turned the anode and cathode which are those little aluminum copper sheets into the veins of a heat sink mm -hmm. and then the rest of it is working like a radiator does where we run a high dielectric coolant across the top and the bottom and there's like a heat sink and some features to pull the heat out of there that is one of the keys to uh, developing battery technology that can charge very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. It doesn't actually matter if it's solid state or anything else. Um, and what we found is we were seeing a delta anywhere from 2 to maybe 6 degrees C, whereas a normal cylindrical cell will see 18 C delta mm -hmm. inside there, um, whether it's from, you know, the side to the center, right, or top to bottom. Right. Um, so one of our key technology pieces though is around what we do you know we everything you this is interesting everything you develop for a vehicle is applicable in the charging systems and the charging technology is applicable into energy storage systems mm -hmm. and distribution right. it's it's all the same stuff yeah that would make sense the um type of coolant that you guys use i mean we're talking about a thousand volts in some cases right yeah or higher yeah, yeah. what about conductivity issues I so, get around that. Uh, so this is uh, especially working in the water world, uh, and it's another interesting thing I like to talk about. Um, water, H two O, pure distilled. I mean, you can go type two or yes. water yeah. is highly resistive, not conductive. So a lot of people don't understand that water has different conductivities. And so if you buy distilled water and you put a thousand volts into it, you shouldn't see any electricity, depending on how far away your leads are. Distance right. is part of the yeah. equation, um, and so. 
that is one way of cooling. So you have a lot of uh, uh, water glycol mix mixtures for coolant systems with anti-corrosion in it. And right. that is kind of the, the primary method that a lot of companies use for cooling systems. You also have oils. So the issue with oils, it's a lot more viscous, especially when it's colder to pump around. But oil is also highly... Uh, um, resistive to electricity yeah, think like your mm -hmm. mineral oils yeah. and mm -hmm. or a version of that anyways so like the transform the utility transformers sometimes you see them on the on the streets over there right. and they have the fins behind them they typically use like a vegetable or, or a mineral oil in there as their coolant and it's able to wick away a lot of that heat so there's a lot of different coolant solutions um but those are the two primary ones that you see on the market if you use water glycol um, like we used uh, an oil-based and some thinner-based solutions. The lower the viscosity, though, the higher the temperature, the operating temperature of it. So if you want something that works at like negative 40, um, then you're sorry. If you go lower viscosity, it'll work at negative 40. The higher ones, they get like gel and they solidify yeah. and stuff uh -huh. like that. So there's like a whole bunch of challenges there. If you use water glycol, which is kind of the accepted standard, right? It's like antifreeze. It's the anything, right. you know, use it in like all vehicles. Don't use antifreeze um, though. Yeah, don't use that. But um, Different type of glycol. Yeah, don't pour it in the, <laughs> the pack. Um, but uh, if you use some of those, the dielectric strength isn't necessarily high. So then you start getting into uh, isolations. So you're you're physically isolating the coolant solution with the the two differentials of the terminal. So okay. it's not just the the liquid never touches, but the component systems and everything related to the pumping, the cooling, and all that stuff they don't touch, and therefore you have a relative physical barrier barrier in between them. Even though you might be pumping a fluid through that, that doesn't have a high dielectric strength. Yeah. That that uh, if it touched yeah. on both sides, it might draw like. I don't know. We, we did it uh, during our testing. We had it. There or we had yeah. voltage. Our first test that we ever did with the megawatt charger, we use just uh, water glycol, and glycol actually adds conductivity to it. Um, um, but it helps with you know, all the additives in there yeah, and everything. And, else. and just yeah, to point yeah. out, there's different types of glycol. Like in antifreeze is poly uh, polyethylene glycol, which is flammable. Uh, probably polypropylene glycol is what you want to use for these type of conductive systems. Um, and we started seeing electrolysis. We were stripping really? the copper because we had an aluminum tank. And so okay. you want to do isolation as your first thing. So you switch your tank to HDPE, high density polyethylene plastic tank, uh, step number one for isolation. Step number two, separate your positive and negative um, so they don't physically touch or at least anywhere close. Distance is also a benefit. Yeah, we even had some that are rated at 100,000 volts break down yes. yeah. when you start doing this stuff. It's just, yeah. And so we, we push everything to the extreme. And so this technology is brand new and we're proud to be the first of many different technologies like coming back to the truck we were the first to talk about 48 volt architecture yeah. the first to talk about uh, automotive ethernet they, they beat us to market but we we were doing automotive ethernet um 48 volt architecture steer by wire brake by wire independent corner brake by wire and steer by wire systems in our original uh, XT, XP platform development programs, there's a whole bunch of YouTube videos of us talking about it. We actually, uh, and it's still functional today, everything from the battery management system out to the vehicle control systems, motor controllers, all the way up to the infotainment is all 48 volt um, automotive ethernet mm -hmm. uh, technology. And we did that, uh, this guy Benoit that used to work for us, um, he sort of pioneered the the mission to do that for me because when he started, we sat down and we were talking about like, how do you beat Ford, right? How do you do better than them? Right. And I'm never going to do better than Ford at being Ford. Mm -hmm. right. Or, right. I mean, mm -hmm. just, you're not going to. So big focus is always going to be on what are the things that they're not doing and where are the gaps and like, where can we bring new technology to this particular vehicle system? So Ben and his team and the, the hardware and software team, they actually took 164 modules in the vehicle and got it down to 32 mm -hmm. total modules mm -hmm. okay. controlling an entire vehicle. That includes all the BMS systems, all the motor controllers, steering control systems, everything. It's about 32 systems inside there. And then a lot of questions that people ask is how do you compete in a market space like that? And I asked them this question in return uh, and a question I'm going to ask to you. Can you name me companies that make uh, EV vehicles. Can you start listing a few of them? Give me seven if you can. All right. So we've got uh, Aptera, which is coming up. Uh, we've got Nikola. We've got Rivian. We've got uh, Tesla, of course. All right. 
Wait a minute, Jesse's flagging at me. Yeah, you got to talk into your mic, Pete. When you're oh, turning okay. towards them, you got to you <laughs> talk into your mic. <laughs> um, where did I leave off? Yes. Yeah, so we've got uh, uh, yeah, we got Nicola. We've got. Uh, so I could I could pause there. So you listed six, and what's interesting is you could have named BMW, Ford. Nissan, True, uh, I think any, those, yeah. but you, you're not naming any of their traditional OEMs, yeah. but they all make EVs. And so when it comes to, you know, the question is, how do you compete against it? Just ask anybody that question. And so you have all these new names that are new, yeah, pun yeah. intended, that are pioneering the way of future mobility. Right. And, and this is our entry in. It's not just batteries. It's not just trucks. It's not just charging. Yeah. I, can you name a company, a big company <laughs> that has, it, we're just going to like ask, we're, let's turn it into a quiz. Yeah. Um, <laughs> name it. No, name, name a big company that has delivered something that is so incredibly innovative that it changed the world. Um, and it was born out of that big company, out of their core product, out of like something that is there and think like the iPhone moments, right? Or something like that. Can you name a very large company? Apple was smaller at the time, right? But yeah. name a big company that has done something like that. Well, it's a company I used to work for, Digital Equipment Corporation. Former IBM, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, part of uh, you know the uh, the landscape of the 60s and 70s, large main, mainframe manufacturers. Uh, you know, the companies that innovate. You know, we've got a billion questions yeah. out there. Should yeah, we yeah. get Let's to some of those? Sean. Yeah, yeah. Sean's got a good question over there. Thank you, Sean. Excellent question. Do you want to read it, Mark? Oh, how much EV charging does it take to break even for your system? Oh, no, no, sorry. Oh. Yeah. Uh, I think you passed. There was questions earlier. Oh, yeah, yeah. that is the question. Sorry. Oh. We have a long list here. Sean Boker. Yeah, Victor's not allowed to read anymore. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I got these sunglasses. But uh, yeah, Sean, is it Boker? I apologize if I uh, butcher your last name. But um, how much EV charging does it take to break even for your system? Uh, apparently, Sean is looking at putting in several in places off the main highways. So uh, depending on usage, your ROI on a charger install could be a year. Uh, it can be as long as five years um, for that particular install, which goes back to why we target 10 years, um, just from a capital ROI perspective. Uh, but you will start to generate cash flow immediately upon install. So let's dig a little bit more into that. Like the example, and one of the reasons we chose Quartzsite as our, our first flagship site is because the traffic from Phoenix to LA like people drive this nearly every 17, single day. 17,000 yeah. vehicles average per day go through that I-10 corridor. And so yeah. when yeah. it comes to utilization, you look at what's in that landscape uh, and there's not much. You have four CCS chargers that's perfectly in the middle in, in Quartzsite. Uh, and my vehicle cannot get past Quartzsite. So I have an Audi e-tron. I have to stop there to charge. And we did two that videos. That was a personal choice. And it, we, yeah. yeah. <laughs> wipes car. Do that. It was a wipes car. <laughs> and so, uh, but I've done that trip nearly a dozen times, but I have to stop there. And we've done videos and we've waited there two hours to charge. So when it comes to utilization at that site, you're basically guaranteed to get uh, vehicles charging at that location over there. But then if you put yourself in the middle of nowhere in, 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 in a city population, well, that's technically not nowhere, but you put yourself in the middle, a lot of people charge at home. Um, you have, yeah. let's say, close to 90% of EV owners charge at home. Um, so why would they use a charger like that? So uh, highway corridors are the ideal location to put uh, high power charging stations because people are en route. They don't want to stay there for hours. They want to keep going. In a gas car, a trip to L.A. takes seven hours. It took me 11, and it, I've done it multiple times. It continues to take 11 hours no matter how fast I drive. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and then the trip to Vegas, for example, from Phoenix metro area, the direct routes, that uh, 89A highway, um, uh, Kingman, uh, Wickenburg, and I can't make it. I can't make it to Kingman. I've done it um, just barely at the, you know, the teeth of my skin or whatever the, the phrase goes. Um, you just have to drive really slow, 40 on an 85 mile an hour highway. Um, mm -hmm. But you'll, you'll make it there. That's another ideal location. So if anybody has a property in uh, uh, Wickenburg um, or any other highway corridors, send us a message. Uh, wiki up. W wiki up. Uh, what's yeah. it? Info at nxuenergy.com. Is that a good email? Yes. Yeah. Uh, By the way, that is the company name. That was another question there. For those of you just coming yes. into the conversation, we NX. are here with two gentlemen from Wait, it's NX. Over here. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> it's on his shirt. 
We uh, have uh, Mark Hanchett, CEO, and uh, our CTO is uh, <laughs> Victor uh, Atlasman. Um, now, here's an ex-comment from uh, Kirill Elizarov. He says, does Tessa know about your ability to charge a Cybertruck? So I have tried multiple times for somebody, please contact me, LinkedIn, Victor Atlasman, as it sounds. Um, I have sent messages. I've communicated through channels. But every time I send a message, I get silence in return. So I'm part of the SEE committee, uh, and Tesla does not attend that committee. Uh, not anymore, they exit out of the megawatt charging committee. Even the J3400, which is the NAX committee for, the, mm -hmm. for their plug, they're pretty silent in it. So they tend to be very quiet about it. Um, I sent a message through a friend to say, hey, we've charged your Cybertruck. And the response I got back was, how? Show me the charge curve. Sent it. And then radio silence. And even the mayor. I don't think you were supposed to. No, this was yeah. public. At, it was public at that time. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, no, we yeah we announced it publicly, but yeah. I, I don't waited. think Tesla expected anyone yeah. to do it. Yeah. And uh, then uh, the mayor of Mesa, uh, Mayor John Giles, actually went last week to uh, uh, Giga Texas. Uh -huh. uh, and he talked about the charger, but there was not any of the ops people there. And so... Some of them are aware, but please, somebody reach out because we definitely want to work together. Interoperability is one of the most important things when it comes to charging because sure. there are systems out there that are just incompatible with other vehicles. And we make sure our view, our charging system is compatible with 100% of the vehicles out there. We're 99. I'm going to pull Chatham all out. Sorry, Nissan Leaf. But there are adapters out there available. <laughs> So well, we occasionally get tests of people chiming in, so uh, if that's the case or if any of you are watching and haven't chimed in, please uh, pass on the information. Highlander, uh, his favorite, uh, his uh, famous phrase is, yes, kindness is always free. Mm -hmm. And uh, YouTube, uh, Highlander also says, wow, awesome podcast. Simon Harris, the act of cooling sounds amazing. Yeah, that's, uh, if you've ever handled a, like, competitor charging system in an Arizona summer, a cable is hot, and mm -hmm. we can maintain that. It, it's almost like it's cool that you want to hang on to it, right? Like, mm -hmm. it's nice and cold. YouTube, Simon Harris, do you guys think anything might replace lithium in the next 10 to 20 years? That's Ooh, a long time frame. Yes. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Um, the beauty of uh, electrification and this sort of energy transition is that almost anything can be the, the energy source that powers it. I do think batteries, energy storage, charging infrastructure is going to be around for probably the next 50 plus years. It, it's a like thing that must happen. But there's going to be there's going to be a future where you probably have some nuclear you know fusion Micro reactor of some kind yep. or whatever they're, they're they are. And we just woke up, Jesse. I'm yeah. a big fusion proponent. Are you, are you, what is the movie like Demolition Man or whatever? Right when he like has the oh yeah yeah that's a classic yes. But they, there is, and I think it's GE uh, that is doing a pilot program right now for these micro nuclear mm -hmm. uh, trailer based systems uh, to power up. Yeah, and they currently it. use them. I mean, obviously, submarines yeah. have used them for a long time. Uh, and then there's uh, satellites that use these. So you're going to start seeing them more well, and more. Kind of going off that other kind of technology, what do you guys uh, think about inductive charging? Oh, that subject. Oh, man. Um, <laughs> I think you were hinting at that earlier, actually. Yeah. So um, I would say, uh, like, inductive charging on my cell phone is amazing. Yep. Um, get rid of the plug, right? Like, there's no reason to have it. Uh, do I think that's going to happen with the EV? Uh, it's tough. Actually, Hillary, um, uh, who is our uh, director, senior director of engineering for charging systems, she actually started her career in the space with a company doing wireless charging, and they're still working on it today. Um, do I think it's going to take off? No, I think like the challenge that you have with that is actually probably the same problem you had with this before they did like the MagSafe. And there's a company actually in town started by a couple of guys yeah. from my, the former company that I used to work for doing like a tabletop stuff where you could set the phone anywhere mm -hmm. and it'll charge. Um, there are, there's probably a path where wireless charging becomes a reality, but there's a ton of just challenges in terms of alignment and um, narrowing that down and like power delivery and stuff. And it's getting more efficient. I think Qualcomm's claimed above 90% efficiency yeah, in, sure. in some cases. So it could get there. But then when you start talking megawatts of power, that's a, that's a really big coil. Yeah. Maybe. Actually, it could be wrong. It could be a lot of current. 
it's efficiency uh, is number yeah. one. And then once you start getting something that large, uh, the heat that it generates, um, and it also has to do with distance. So the farther away you are, the less efficient it is. And then the next thing is safety. You know, you put a ball of aluminum foil in it, it will conduct through that through that wave form mm -hmm. between the two. So there's a lot of factors, and that was part of the projects Hillary was talking about, was trying to identify uh, uh, something that shouldn't belong in that field. Yeah, when I when I started, I looked at uh, I actually looked at battery swaps in the beginning, like really, yeah, okay. like the yeah. Whole, like Neo, yeah, like yeah. Neo, yeah, like exactly Neo. like right. Neo. Um, but the challenge was always uh, you look around, like go look in your parking lot. It, there's so many different vehicle sizes, shapes, yeah. lengths, battery pack, you know, whatever it is. It I'm not convinced that that truly scaled. Um, but that's where I started because I mean that could be a five minute swap like neo does right mm -hmm. it could be super fast um and it eliminates the high cost of the the battery pack and what's there uh, so i looked at all of that stuff and there it obviously very much so can be done it's just i don't know if i have an answer of like when i think there's use cases that maybe try to make sense today which is like pulling into your garage at home right or something like that yeah, do i think slower. the roads are going to conduct no yeah, the cost. Um, the cost is way now, too high. The battery swaps is an interesting conversation that I have with people because uh, here in the U.S. culturally, I don't think it would be accepted um, because the issue is, and uh, I was talking earlier uh, about it, where I'm probably the worst EV owner possible. I fast charge every single day. Um, I drain the try, car. You're trying to break it before your warranty runs out. <laughs> so, um, well kept secret. What's the warranty yeah. for? <laughs> but the, but the example here is you might maintain your zero to 80 i charge 200 percent on a fast charge so you might do let's say uh 30 to 80 percent uh and slow charge your battery so you take good care of your battery you drive you know speed limit me i abuse it i'll go fast i'll i'll, I'll charge 200 i'll drain it to zero and i'll abuse that battery if we do a battery swap and i have your battery and you have mine how would that make you feel that, that's been the biggest uh, complaint i think or the biggest uh, concern you know, the other thing, Kyle Connor actually did one of these battery swaps in Norway when he was visiting there. Mm -hmm. It was in winter, and uh, I looked at the logistics of this whole thing. First of all, there were some chargers outside the building, and there wasn't anybody there. It would have been faster, I think, just simply go charge, have a sandwich, and come back, right? But anyway, I looked at the logistics. I looked at the ice. I looked at the water. I looked at the hydraulics. You know, all of the stuff that had all to take place. All the cost and expense and oh, complexity. Totally, the complexity. And then, like you're saying, how do you know whose battery you're getting? You know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. They don't want your battery. Do you, yeah. So you mentioned that, like, go get a sandwich, go do all that stuff. Yeah. There, It's interesting when we start thinking about the different use cases today around charging. So... When we talk charging, we're obviously talking like this high-powered highway corridor, fast, like yeah. fast thing, because that's what we want. I just actually got home about 4 a.m. this morning. My daughter does competition cheer. Mm -hmm. So we were in Anaheim over the weekend, and I had to be back today. Mm -hmm. So we left last night, I don't know, 8.30 at night. We drive a Tesla. I got home at 4.30 this morning. And oh, yeah. the challenge is... Um, there wasn't a ton of traffic, even though there was some use of those particular systems, particularly in like the Southern California area, every charging location is full. Mm -hmm. Um, but the consistency, like I plugged in once and it was 30 kilowatts, mm -hmm. right? I plugged yeah. in the next time it's like 50 or the next one it's, you know, I think we did get like some two forties, two fifties when you get to like the, the more remote areas because there's no Life. one else there. Yeah. Um, but uh, we typically talk about it and then all the other companies and all these other like church point providers, they deploy these super high powered ones in mall parking lots or like grocery stores. But the reality is you don't want something that, you know, you're going to plug in, you're going to go inside and you're going to like go shopping or whatever it is. You don't want it to ding you in 30 or 40 minutes and say, come out here. Or we're going to start charging you by mm -hmm. the minute. Right. What you really want is you want those low, like true lower powered, say 30 kilowatt max systems in those locations. And we, you know, we can scale this thing up and down, right, to those particular sizes. And I think that's critical of there are different use cases for different sizes. And a lot of them are trying to figure out like, well, 200 kilowatts, but it's in a mall. Well, the people that are pulling in there are the ones traveling somewhere else. They don't really want to go to the mall. So put the higher powered ones for the, the true travel corridors, 
come in and put lower powered ones for the people that are at those locations where, you know, they want to go shopping. And my wife and my daughter, they spent like three hours at the Scottsdale mall. The other, I think three hours at the mall. I don't know what they're doing there. That's not my area. Um, but they don't, you know, they don't need a 200 kilowatt, 300 kilowatt system at the mall. They need something slow that's going to trickle right, fill that thing up. So then when they come home, they can come home. But if she's running around doing errands all day, right? And she's Take like, yeah, she time matters, right? You want to plug in, go quickly, but you want that like in those travel corridors. Right. Don't know what the solution is for that. It's just you, you have to balance between the different locations. Mm-hmm. More chargers. Um, Highlander, 100% on the distilled water or any water electricity takes the path of least resistance and that's not water. That's right. Highlander also says, I'm loving this podcast and it's rare for me. What does that mean, Highlander? You don't like our other ones? Oh, <laughs> <yeah. laughs> <laughs> Instagram, Mahmoud.Zim says, hi there. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. YouTube, again, Highlander. Fusion Forever, he just mentioned... Submarines, you know, it's I'm a nuclear submariner. He is, yes. Yeah, you know, oh, okay. a, a fun fact, I'm actually certified in the state of Arizona's RSO. That's a radiation safety officer. Oh, really? So I'm an ASU grad. I don't know how we got a safety. Like, I have certifications uh, in the most random things. Yeah. A, a grade D water operator for New York City. All these random. Vic uh, Victor's the I guy where we're like, hey, we want to do a video. Let's melt a cable. He's like, car battery, two wires, yep. let's go. <laughs> yeah, let's do it. <laughs> and so uh, ASU offer this course for uh, for doing the certification as a radiation safety officer, especially since APS has Palo Verde nuclear plant over here. You know, it was something that's uh, uh, very interesting to me to learn about, uh, you know, how you enrich uranium and then how do you design uh, reactors, but also hospitals and doctor's offices. You're going to notice that a lot of the, the radiation equipment are either on the top level or the basement, so you don't have to shield all six walls. Oh, okay, and, and, and that's that. the reason yeah. they do that. Yeah. So they typically have it on the on the top uh, floor so they don't have to uh, mm -hmm. protect the ceiling because it's very expensive to do those layers of either concrete or lead. Mm -hmm. um, and there was an interesting story where there was this uh, a clinic, a uh, doctor's clinic that had uh, x-ray equipment next to a nail salon um, and without actually protecting the walls, and that's why they have the RSOs uh, throughout the country, and uh, realizing that um, it was irradiating the, the, the ladies that were getting their nails done. Oh, my God. Uh, yeah. And this is many, many years back. So um, they enacted all these safety protocols for all this equipment. I, I'm always concerned when, like, I'm getting an x-ray, right? And they just, like, put something right <laughs> the here. Yeah. But then the, the, the other person, the lady, like, walks behind a, <laughs> you know, like a wall. And whatever. I'm like, all right, whatever. But uh, uh, they have actually now use a lot less uh, radioactive material than they did back then by, like, hundreds. And if you fly, you're exposed to more radiation than you are in an x-ray for an entire year in one flight. Yeah. Really? Yeah. yeah so, uh, okay. And it has to do with the sun uh, because there's less material, basically, atmosphere to protect you and right. as you get closer to the sun you're hit with more radiation right. um all these yeah, that's random adds to my fear of flying yeah um <laughs> some some other random facts because I, I love these random facts so electronics are affected by altitude and it was something i was i did not understand until an applications engineer from a semiconductor plant told me why um if you install something on the top of mount everest it has nothing to do with air density um, solar radiation actually affects, the gamma rays actually hit the silicon wafers and affects your performance. So your charger performance, you might get 100 kilowatts on sea level, but you might get 95 kilowatts of energy from being in the mound. I'm doing a gross exaggeration here. Yeah, a little too far. Uh, exaggeration, but that, but yes. that has to do with solar radiation. And it took years for them to figure that out. Well, guys, we're running on to almost an hour and a half here. It's been one of the most fascinating podcasts we have done. Extraordinarily technical. In summarizing, what uh, what can you guys uh, tell us? Well, I mean, I'm, you know, new, founding new, coming through this, the journey that we've been on, everything has been this. Um, it's been a lot of fun for me. Mm -hmm. um, I this We were talking earlier today, right? It's like, what else would you do? Right. This is the only thing I know how to do right. now. So, um, but today we're really, I just, I love what the team is doing. We, we are a smaller team now than we were a year ago. We're still doing innovation and technology, but I'm really, really, truly excited about kind of the future of infrastructure, energy, in particular charging and what we're doing with like the new one systems, 
everything we do is forward thinking. Mm -hmm. Everything is, it's not today. I'm not solving today's problems because today's problems are already solved. We're really trying to solve tomorrow's problems and bring value tomorrow. And the the picture of tomorrow is is going to be incredibly exciting, at least for me. So that's that's what I'm excited yeah, about. It's uh, one of the reasons I'm here is we're here to to break new technology into the world, and it's very necessary to yeah. to bring what's available in the future to the people today. And so that includes fast charging, not just on the charger side, but also the battery side and the vehicle landscape. Having vehicles that are more efficient, being able to compete against ICE vehicles, going 500 miles, being able to tow 40,000 pounds with no problem, and refueling in under 15 minutes is really really important technology that needs to get out there and then same thing energy distributed energy resources allowing people to uh, have access to electricity basically abundantly everywhere um, mm -hmm. and we need to be or at least someone needs to be out there in the forefront to bring that technology to the masses well gentlemen um i am i am uh, very pleased that you came out um you know it takes visionaries like you guys to really bring home new technologies and uh, you know, innovate at the level that you guys are, and uh, we we wish you the best of luck in all of the endeavors. And uh, since you're local here, I'm sure we'll do more of these types of things. Maybe we can uh, head out there too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you yeah go. definitely. Do it on site. Uh, by the way, I got to point out, he said new technology, so that was very uh, yeah. that was yeah, play on words. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. We we also do a podcast, uh, yeah. and so it's called the Disconnect Podcast. You can find it on uh, Spotify, YouTube, uh, and mm -hmm. other uh, 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 mediums, and we pretty much push a video at least once a week of the technology that we're working on. Uh, recently we did the Cybertruck Curve and there's a few other vehicles that we're working on to demonstrate the maximum amount of power that these vehicles are capable of and showing the cutting edge of everything that's out there. So, you know, open invitation for you, a tour and uh, Thank you. guest yes. role in a podcast. Well, and our audience, we appreciate all of the comments and the inputs and uh, we will see you tomorrow morning. Tomorrow morning is our EV podcast at 10 a.m. Mountain Standard Time and 11 o'clock we go to the Tesla Roadster podcast Sweet. and uh, we've got a lot to cover. So again, thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time. Thank, Thank you. you.